where your faith can be restored. Come on, let's go on revival. Welcome, Welcome to revival. revival. Welcome to revival. Welcome to revival. Come be blessed. It's going to be a great time in the Lord. Revival. Make sure you come to Revival. Officially celebrating 175 years, welcome to the historic Central Baptist Church where we're making disciples and transforming lives. It's October 12th, the second Sunday of Breast Cancer Appreciation Month. We celebrate all of our breast cancer survivors, honor those fighters who have gone before us, and strongly encourage you to do monthly self-checks and routine mammograms. Show your support and share your testimonies by posting yourself in pink on social media today and tagging Central and Pastor Riley. Here's what's central to you. Welcome to the second night of our virtual fall revival in Dr. James M. Whitaker lecture series, which continues every Tuesday in October at 7 p.m. Along with the latest pandemic information and tips for our mental health, we will hear God's word from a different dynamic guest preacher each week. Next Tuesday, we welcome back the renowned senior pastor of Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church in Houston, Texas, Reverend Dr. Marcus D. Cosby. But I've been in church long enough to know that everybody in church got some kind of issue. <laughs> oh, let's be clear. Your issue may not be my issue and my issue may not be yours. But all of us have something with which we're dealing on a Tuesday night. Can I find some honest people in here who can testify we all got something going on? Maybe your issue is, is a spousal issue. You so glad you in church tonight because that means you ain't got to be at that house messing around with that person. You don't want to be bothered with it. Every time the garage door go up, you're like, oh, Lord, they're coming back again. You got a spouse. Oh, that's not your issue. Or oh, maybe your issue is a lack of a spouse issue. You thought by now, Jesus, come on, Jesus, as much as I love you, I thought you would have hooked me up by now. Then, 10 a.m. worship next Sunday is time for our homecoming. It's annual Family and Friends Day. Invite all your family, friends, neighbors, and those disciples we have been missing to worship with us in person with pre-registration or virtual. I'm Brian Emmons, and I hope you all have a blessed week.
just lift those hands and say, I will exalt you. I will exalt you. I will exalt you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Yeah.
all of my worship. Receive it, God. Receive my worship. All of my worship. Yes. Come on, come on. He's listening right there. Come on, some of you had to press your way in this morning. Central family and friends. My name is Sabrina Wanamaker, and I am here to speak on being trauma-informed within our families. Uh, thank you, Pastor Riley, for the opportunity. So let's hop right in. So when we think about trauma, in a lot of instances, we think about trauma as being the event. But trauma is actually defined as an event, a series of events, or even a set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as being physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. And this experience has lasting adverse effects on that person. And so it can impact their ability to function, their mental, physical, social, and emotional, and also their spiritual well-being. So trauma is not the event in and of itself, but it's really about how an individual experiences the event and those lasting adverse or unfavorable effects of that. And so trauma is about perception. If trauma was not based in perception, then eight minutes and 46 seconds would affect everyone in the same way, regardless of race, age, or experience in life. However, because trauma is based in perception, each individual views the eight minutes and 46 seconds from a different direction and also has a different impact or felt a different impact from that particular instance. So when we think about trauma-informed care, trauma-informed care shifts from the what's wrong with you to the what's happened to you. And so it looks at the effects of the events on a person and it takes that into consideration. And so instead of asking or making the comment, something's wrong with them, they've changed, they're different, and then passing judgment and also um, sometimes shifting our reactions to that individual, when we take into consideration what has happened to a person, what they have experienced and what that could have been like for them, it can shift our perspective and also our response to the individuals and to, the, to those around us. So when we talk about being trauma-informed within our families, we consider the circumstances, the situations, the events and the traumas that our family has, has experienced as a whole, but also those individuals within our family unit. The key is understanding that even in the closest families who experience the same things, family members can have a different reaction. And those reactions um, can differ based on age, developmental level, the trauma history, but also like family connections and relationships and their personal exposure. So one person could have experienced it, Another person could have witnessed it and another heard about it after the fact. And while each person may have an emotional response, only some will develop that traumatic stress reaction. And each person will take a different time to recover and to heal. Reactions can really vary um, depending on the individual. And sometimes it can look like um, academic difficulties, attention challenges, nightmares, challenges eating and sleeping, physical symptoms such as aches and pains. Um, and children, a lot of times we see behavioral changes, um, difficulty forming attachments and regression or loss of previously acquired skills. Um, for older individuals, it could be uh, engaging in risky behaviors like using drugs or substances or unhealthy physical relationships. And so each person will have a different response. When we're thinking about family situations, it's essential to understand that people within the same household who experience the same things can have a different response. And reminders of those events, like retelling the story, 
the anniversaries, the locations, and the variety and just various things can trigger certain reactions. So as we engage with our families, we, we want to be mindful that we don't try to force our feelings and how we experience something onto others, but also that we don't negate the fact that others could have experienced it differently from us and may have a more intense emotional or traumatic response. Trauma disrupts our capacity to feel safe. And so the things that we can do to really support each other is including creating an emotionally safe space by being a calm listening presence and really exploring the what happened to you instead of the what's wrong with you. And our responses to trauma are really unexpected and they can catch us off guard. However, when we find that we're experiencing some of those things and we're in those spaces and we find that we have that residual impact from that event or those circumstances, it is absolutely okay to seek therapy. There are therapists who specialize in trauma-informed care for families, children, and adults. And um, you can find some of those resources through your local community mental health centers, um, provider directory with your insurance company, or even on online websites like Psychology Today. Just remember, we all experience things differently and extending the grace and understanding to those closest to us can help us to strengthen our family relationships and our family connections. Have a blessed evening and hope to see you soon. Well, good evening and welcome to Central Online. Excited we are that you join us for this second night of our fall virtual revival in Dr. Whitaker lecture series. An awesome time together in God's word and worship on last week. And we're back tonight to continue in this conversation. Tonight we welcome one of God's most gifted preachers, a good friend of this church, Dr. Leslie Callahan, St. Paul Church, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Let's get ready now to receive her. Be blessed with God's word. It's your first night with us at Central. Drop your name in the comment section of the chat room. We want to uh, engage with you on tonight and welcome you to be part of our worshiping congregation. Right now, let's worship the Lord through giving. We believe that God is worthy of the tithe and the offering. Someone has not given their tithe, they bring the tithe first. Above the tithe, asking you to bring your generous offering tonight. That represents your best. Asking each family to bring $10 to contribute to this effort. As you are fed by God's word, you sow back into the ministry that has been feeding, feeding you. Um, I'm going to double that gift tonight and give 20. I believe we're going to be blessed. Uh, the word comes from our guest preacher. Let's consecrate these gifts before we give them. God, thank you tonight for gift and forgiver. Receive these generous gifts now as expressions of our love for you and multiply them as you find us faithful, making disciples and transforming lives. In Jesus' name, children of God said together, amen. God bless you as you give. I will make room for you. Yes, I will prepare for two So.
God bless you, Central Baptist Church, and thank God for the opportunity that we have to share together in worship and in this time of revival. I am deeply appreciative of the invitation that your pastor has extended. He and I have been blessed to share together in an important conversation about church and clergy finances um, over these last I guess coming up on, we're coming up on our third year. And um, I am thankful for the opportunity to get to know him 
um, and grateful for uh, my second invitation to Central. Um, again, as I said last year when we shared together, I look forward to the time when we'll be able to see one another in person. I believe that that time is coming. In the meantime, I am so deeply grateful for what we can do through technology and for always, I am grateful to God for the privilege of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, it never gets old. It's always fresh and new, and I am um, humbled and grateful that God gifts me with this opportunity to proclaim it. I invite you to give your attention to the word of the Lord as it's found in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. I bet this is a familiar text. Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning at the first verse. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Listen for the word of the Lord. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and God brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. God led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. God said to me, mortal, can these bones live? I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. Then God said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So, I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then God said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to preach during this revival from the subject, a word of hope to weary bones. A word of hope to weary Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer, we pray through Jesus Christ. And God's people said, Amen. There are a number of idioms related to bones, a number of phrases that carry special meaning that have the word bones in them. And all of these idioms that have the word bones in them carry the sense that what is in the bones is at the very depths of being. When we say to, that somebody is bad to the bone, 
What we're saying is that bad behavior is not episodic for them, uh, that it's not an occasional problem, bad behavior. The bad intentions are not occasionally present, but badness, meanness, evil is intrinsic to them. It comes from the depths. And when we say sometimes of ourselves that we are bone tired, we're talking about the kind of exhaustion that goes beyond the surface level. It's not the kind that a nap will fix. Although naps are helpful with many other things. No, when we talk about bone tired or bone weary, we speak of the weariness and the exhaustion where our body is tired. Yes, but it's more than just our body. It's also our mind and our spirit. Something about weariness that goes to the depth. Something about weariness and exhaustion that goes to the very essence and the center of our being. Somebody who's listening to me knows what it's like to be bone tired, to have bone weariness. The kind that you cannot shake off, the kind that a vacation won't cure, the kind uh, that you cannot simply will away. Just going harder or taking a vitamin will not allow it to go away. This bone weariness sometimes happens to individuals and it sometimes happened to peoples. Uh, When uh, Fannie Lou Hamer of blessed memory said that she was sick and tired of being sick and tired, uh, she was speaking of herself. She was speaking of her own experience of being black and female, black and woman in the United States of America in uh, uh, the middle uh, of the 20th century. Uh, But when she said she was sick and tired of being sick and tired, she also knew that she spoke for more than just herself. Uh, She spoke uh, for more than just for black Mississippians. She spoke to and for black people in general. Uh, Weariness, bone weariness uh, is something that happens both to individuals and also to peoples. That's the condition in which the people of God find themselves in the book of the prophet Ezekiel. All of the things that they counted on in the city of God, in in Jerusalem, the city of David that was the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah, all of the the protection that they counted on in being near the place where God's name was, all that they counted on in being in the city where the temple was, uh, all that they had counted on in the place where they had been planted by God, all of that seemed lost as they are now in exile. Ezekiel prophesies as a priest without a temple to a people without a place, without a home, and the very promise that was attached to the place feels like it is lost along with their identity as a people. They are a defeated community, and they are bone-weary. It is into this context that God calls Ezekiel and gives Ezekiel visions, including this famous vision recorded and recounted in Ezekiel chapter 37. I love how this text begins with the action and activity of God at work with God's prophet. The hand of the Lord came upon me and... God brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. 
Uh, do you see how God, God who is everywhere, God uh, who fills all spaces, uh, gives uh, Ezekiel access uh, to a vision and perspective. Uh, God gives Ezekiel access by God's own hand, God's hand uh, and God's spirit or God's wind, God's breath, God's air in motion, uh, God's hand and God's breath and spirit uh, move Ezekiel from the physical place where he is and places him down in another place. Uh, what is so powerful about uh, this uh, notion of access is the way that it reminds us that if we are going to do prophetic work, if we are going to be able to speak uh, uh, the prophetic word, we are going to have to go to the places where the weary are actually dwelling. Uh, what's so powerful powerful about the story of Ezekiel is that God does not give Ezekiel a word for those who have been exiled. God doesn't give him that word in the place of the homeland. Ezekiel is right down there in exile with the people of God by those waters of Babylon where they sat down and wept. Ezekiel also sits down and we have to know Ezekiel also weeps. Uh, and not only is he in the physical place of Babylon, uh, but by means of this vision, uh, God uh, gives Ezekiel access uh, to the spiritual experience uh, of feeling defeated, of feeling displaced, of feeling disconnected in exile. God uh, will allow us access to the valley, people of God, uh, in order to allow us to be able to speak to the valley circumstances. God takes Ezekiel and gives Ezekiel access to the place of pain, access to the valley of defeat, access to the exi exiled place. And then God invites Ezekiel, who now has access, God invites Ezekiel to assess. Do you see the hand of the Lord uh, not just placing Ezekiel in that valley, uh, but leading him around in the midst of the valley? Uh, the same spirit and the same hand uh, that drops him in the valley uh, uh, guides him amongst uh, those bones that are in the valley, um, offers Ezekiel the opportunity uh, to assess uh, the situation in the valley. Uh, do you see it in verse two uh, that the valley, the end of verse one says uh, that God set me in the middle of the valley that was full of bones. Uh, that is a superficial uh, assessment. Uh, but in verse two, God then leads Ezekiel around uh, in the midst of that horror show that is the bones. Uh, uh, look at here. Now I know that not only are there bones in the valley, uh, but I see how many bones there are in the valley. They are lying bones in the valley and the bones are very dry. Uh, wander around in the midst of these bones. Uh, look at the bones and see their condition. Look at the devastated people and see their trauma. Get a vision and a clear perspective. Uh, assess what you see, not from far away, but from the very midst of the valley. Uh, so often uh, we try to offer a cure without seeing the hurt. We try to offer prescriptions without adequate diagnoses. But what I see God calling Ezekiel to in the text and what I feel God calling us to in the moment we are in is an accurate and adequate assessment of the pain in our midst. Can 
we account? Do we have the courage, even by the hand of God and even by the Spirit of God, do we have the courage to account for the enormity of the injury? Can we see just how disconnected these bones are? Can we see how fragmented these people are? Can we account for the enormity of the pain? Uh, let me say to you, Central Baptist Church, that I see, and as I read uh, the studies and the surveys, it, it is clear that the credit of the Church of Jesus Christ here in the United States of America. Our credibility is in crisis. We have a crisis of credibility in part because we have difficulty telling the truth. We have difficulty assessing the real damage among us. Um, uh, Jeremiah once wrote in the name of the Lord that uh, the false prophets heal uh, the the hurt of the daughters of my people superficially saying peace, peace where there is no peace. Sometimes we are more like the false prophets in Jeremiah's time than we are like the true prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Amos and others, because we offer superficial assessments. We are unwilling to get down there in the valley and walk around in the middle of the bones. But God does not allow Ezekiel to stand back. God uh, walks uh, Ezekiel around so that he can assess the condition of the bones. And then God asks an assessment question. Uh, mortal, uh, these bones, can these bones live? Uh, it is an assessment, I, I believe, not only of the condition of the bones, but it's also an assessment of the condition of the prophet. Can mortal, can these bones live? What is the state prophet? What is the state preacher? What is the state congregation, people of God? What's the state of your own faith? Oh, how much optimism do you have? What kind of hope do you espouse and harbor for the future of your own people? Uh, not somebody else somewhere else, but these people, these dry, not just dry, but very dry, these fragmented, disconnected bones. You can't tell who's who or what's what. Can these bones live while you're doing your assessment, while you're walking around in the midst of the devastation, while you're looking at the fragmentation and disconnection? What kind of hope do you have for what you see? Can these bones live. Uh, notice that the prophet doesn't answer directly. He does not say no, that the bones cannot live, but I suspect that he doesn't feel like he can say with any clarity or definitive confidence, he can't say yes either. And so what he offers is a wonderful thing and, and a wonderful model for us in the place where the devastation seems too much. What he offers is an openness to see what God can and will do. Oh God, I don't know, but I know you know. And so having given Ezekiel access to the devastation and the weariness, having given Ezekiel the opportunity to assess just how bad things actually are, then God gives the prophet a command to address, to address these very 
bones. Um, uh, what I love about how God works is that God partners with human beings. God gifts us with skills and talents. God calls us into the work of ministry, drops us down in weary and hopeless places as we live with weariness and hopelessness ourselves. And then God instigates and calls and commands us to use the gifts that God has given us to address the bones, hallelujah, where we are. Ezekiel is a prophet, prophet, prophesy. Singers, sing. Carpenters, build. Whoever and whatever you are, be that where you are, for the communities where you are, in the midst of the devastation where you are, so that where you are is affected by the power of the God who calls you. Ezekiel is a prophet, and so he's called to prophesy. Like I said, whatever it is that you have, whoever it is that you are, whatever it gifts you have that can be used. Oh, the beauty of how God partners with humanity is that God calls us to bring who we are and what we are and what we have and place them in service at the command of God for transformation in the places where we are found. Uh, the condition of the bones, the very fact uh, uh, that uh, the ears uh, are not connected with the tiniest bones uh, of those ears detached doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that the bones cannot hear as Ezekiel prophesies. What God is calling for it from the prophet is obedience to the command of God and the placement of the gifts that God has put in the prophet in service of the work and will of God. Uh, prophesy to these bones. Uh, it doesn't matter that the bones can't hear. Uh, just prophesy. Oh, you dry bones. Uh, yes, these bones uh, hear the word of the Lord. It's not the, uh, it's not the potential of the bones. Uh, it's the obedience of the prophet that's being tested here. It is not the work of the prophet to put the bones together. It is the work of the prophet to use the gifts that God has given for the sake of the work to which the prophet has been called. And so uh, Ezekiel, uh, I wish I could hear all that was going through his mind. But what I know for sure is that Ezekiel has gotten in the habit of obedience to God and begins to prophesy. And as he begins to speak, uh, the bones, hallelujah, begin to rattle. The bones begin to rattle. And I love the way our ancestors put it. Those bones, those bones, those dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And the toe connects to the foot and the foot to the ankle and the ankle to the shin and the shin to the knee and the knee to the thigh and the thigh to the hip and the hip to the back, to the neck, to the skull and arms and uh, 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 chest and ribs and all of the bones come together, each bone to its bone, bones flying everywhere, weary bones becoming uh, alive again, coming uh, uh, to have movement again, blown about again at the word of the Lord. As they come together, uh, the soft tissue and the sinews uh, also come on the bones uh, and the skin comes on the bones uh, and there they are no longer bones alone, not just uh, fragmented bones, nor even just skeletons, uh, but they begin to look like people. Uh, again, uh, the only problem is uh, that they look like dead people. The Spirit of the Lord uh, speaks to Ezekiel again and says, this is not all I promised. 
Oh, people of God, I, I hear a challenge from the Spirit. Sometimes we are satisfied with progress that takes us from being dry bones to human-like corpses. We, we're willing to accept this intermediate step and get stuck at the point where we look like people even though we don't yet have life. Oh, but I hear the Spirit of God reminding us that Good-looking corpses is not what God promised. God says to Ezekiel at the beginning of this passage of Scripture that I will put breath into them and they will live. Not when they look better will they know that I am the Lord, but when they are alive. Right now, they look like people, but they're not yet alive because the wind and the breath is not in them. The air has gone out of them. And what I love about the text is that God does not allow Ezekiel to be satisfied with progress that does not lead to actual life. Um, God has an answer, hallelujah, for the airless. God has an answer for the breathless. God has an answer, beloved people of God, for those who've been scattered by the winds of change and the tornadoes of violence. God has an answer that says that we can be brought back together from every direction to which we have been scattered, that reparation is possible, and that it involves not just looking better, but actually being alive. Uh, do you hear? Prophesy to the wind, to the north. Some were scattered to the north, to the south. Some were scattered to the south, to the east. Some were scattered to the east, to the west. Some were scattered to the west. The exiled were scattered to the four corners. Prophesy to the wind to come back into them. And that's what happens. Ezekiel has has the courage to do what God has called for and prophesy such that reparation comes. And by the end of the scene, they are alive. They are standing on their feet. They are an army. They're ready to go forward. This central is what it means to be prophetic community. And that is what we are called to be as the church. In God's mind before the foundation of the world. This is what it means for us to be the church. The church that Jesus promised to build. The church that Jesus promised could not be destroyed even by the very gates of hell. This is what it means for us to be the church. The joy and the promise that was set before Jesus as he marched up Golgotha's hill carrying the cross, carrying of the very weight of the sins of the world. This is the joy and the promise that he looked for as he endured the cross and despised the shame. The church for whom Jesus now intercedes as he sits on the right hand of majesty on high. The resurrected Christ makes intercession for us as the church. This is what it means to be the church that Jesus died and rose for. The whole point of the resurrection, the whole point in being filled with God's Spirit, the whole point of the message, the whole point of the gospel is for us to be made alive by God's Spirit and to speak into devastated, dying, and dead places, fragmented 
tormented conditions and weary bones with the word of life. This is the end and the purpose of it all. The resurrection that says again and again the word of God. I will place my spirit in you and you will live. We should be satisfied with nothing less than the life God promised. We should be satisfied with nothing less than the abundant life that Jesus promised. The thief comes to kill and to steal and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Life in love, life in faith, life in hope. Live the word of God comes to us. Live such that the scattered and the fragmented come together. Live so that the disconnected become reconnected. Live so that the dried up bones become not a skeleton to live in a closet, but a human being with bones and sinews and flesh and flowing blood and breathing lungs. Those who are exhausted and robbed of breath those who have lost inspiration and purpose, to them comes the prophecy, I, God says, will place my spirit in you and you will live. For the exiles, there is a home. At the end of the story, there is not only the address in the sense of the word that is spoken, but there is an address in the sense of a home, a place to live, a place to be, a place to thrive. This is the hope we proclaim the acknowledgement that we all need a home and the promise that God in Christ has a place for us, not only in the hereafter, but also in the here and now. And when I situate you alive in a community that is home, when I give you life through the Spirit, you will know, then you will know, that I, God says, that I am the Lord. I'm the Lord who strengthens. I'm the Lord who heals. Oh, beloved, God says, I'm the Lord who restores. I'm the Lord who helps. I'm the Lord who gives hope. Even to your weary bones. Thank God. Amen. There's someone here tonight who needed to hear that word. And for you, perhaps you're going to stock up that word, store it up for a day when you will need it. But someone needs the hope that was proclaimed through the gospel tonight. That hope comes by a life-giving, life-transforming, life-altering relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Tonight, if you've never been baptized, not been born again, haven't made God first place in your life, we offer Christ to you. Someone perhaps knows Christ, but does not have a church home, a place where you are attached and connected. We want to be your church. I want to be your pastor, but the choice is yours. So go on our website, cbcstl.org, fill out that forms tab, or email us at askcentral at cbcstl.org, your name, your contact number, your email address. We want to discuss this week your decision for Christ and for church. The choice is yours. Welcome to, welcome to Central. I want to remind church we are not having Bible study on tomorrow. 
engaged in a revival each Tuesday in the month of October. So there's no 12 noon or 7 p.m. Bible study. Uh, please make sure you join us on Sunday morning. Uh, this family and friends experience invites someone to be with us in worship here at Central Baptist Church physically or online. If you have not yet registered, do so as soon as possible. Uh, once, we end, once we close capacity, rather, we'll no longer be able to accommodate individuals in the sanctuary building. We are excited to welcome our youngest disciples to worship. Uh, nursery, for those who are zero through four years old. Kindergarten through fifth grade for our children. Sixth grade through twelfth grade for our young people. Register online today. There's capacity for each group, including our children. Join us. Bring someone. And even come online. Uh, have a watch party at your home. Invite someone you know. Text them the link. Say, listen, you want to hear the word of God proclaimed in this, in this place. Nehemiah, rebuilding after crisis. As we conclude tonight, help me praise God for the preaching gift, the Reverend Dr. Leslie Callahan, St. Paul Church, Philadelphia. God knows what you need to hear. And I pray the ones who have an ear hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let's pray. God, thank you tonight for what we have seen and heard and felt. God, plant your word deep in our hearts. Instruct us about our faith and our health. That in the days to come, we make wise decisions that honor you, show our love for you, our love for humanity. Now, God, go with us. Give us good rest tonight and raise us up on tomorrow to represent you well publicly and privately in that which we do and say. So in the strong name of Jesus, the children of God said together, amen. God bless you. And now here's what's central to you. Officially celebrating 175 years, welcome to the historic Central Baptist Church where we are making disciples and transforming lives. It's October 12th, the second Sunday of Breast Cancer Appreciation Month. We celebrate all of our breast cancer survivors, honor those fighters who have gone before us, and strongly encourage you to do monthly self-checks and routine mammograms. Show your support and share your testimonies by posting yourself in pink on social media today and tagging Central and Pastor Riley. Here's what's central to you. Welcome to the second night of our virtual fall revival in Dr. James M. Whitaker lecture series, which continues every Tuesday in October at 7 p.m. Along with the latest pandemic information and tips for our mental health, we will hear God's word from a different dynamic guest preacher each week. Next Tuesday, we welcome back the renowned senior pastor of Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church in Houston, Texas, Reverend Dr. Marcus D. Cosby. But I've been in church long enough to know that everybody in church got some kind of issue. <laughs> oh, let's be clear. Your issue may not be my issue and my issue may not be yours, but all of us have something with which we're dealing on a Tuesday night. Can I find some honest people in here who can testify we all got something going on? Maybe your issue is, is a spousal issue. You so glad you in church tonight because that means you ain't got to be at that house messing around with that person. You don't want to be bothered with it. Every time the garage door go up, you're like, oh, Lord, they're coming back again. You got a spouse. Oh, that's not your issue. Or oh, maybe your issue is a lack of a spouse issue. You thought by now, Jesus, come on, Jesus, as much as I love you, I thought you would have hooked me up by now. Then, 10 a.m. worship next Sunday is time for our homecoming. It's annual Family and Friends Day. Invite all your family, friends, neighbors, and those disciples we've been missing to worship with us in person with pre-registration or virtually. I'm Brian Emmons, and I hope you all have a blessed week.